A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Eighteen, Nine Days. The marriage day was shining brightly, and they were ready outside the closed door of the doctor's room, where he was speaking with Charles Darnay. They were ready to go to church, the beautiful bride, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross, to whom the event, through a gradual process of reconcilement to the inevitable, would have been one of absolute bliss, but for the yet lingering consideration that her brother Solomon should have been the bridegroom. And so, said Mr. Lorry, who could not sufficiently admire the bride, and who had been moving round her to take in every point of her quiet, pretty dress, and so it was for this, my sweet Lucy, that I brought you across the channel, such a baby! Lord bless me! How little I thought what I was doing! How lightly I valued the obligation I was conferring on my friend Mr. Charles! "'You didn't mean it,' remarked the matter-of-fact Miss Pross, "'and therefore how could you know it? Nonsense!' "'Really? Well, but don't cry,' said the gentle Mr. Lorry. "'I am not crying,' said Miss Pross. "'You are.' "'I am my Pross?' By this time Mr. Lorry dared to be pleasant with her on occasion. "'You were just now. I saw you do it, and I don't wonder at it. Such a present of plate as you have made em is enough to bring tears into anybody's eyes. There's not a fork or a spoon in the collection,' said Miss Pross, "'that I didn't cry over last night after the box came, till I couldn't see it.' "'I am highly gratified,' said Mr. Lorry, "'though, upon my honour, I had no intention of rendering those trifling articles of remembrance invisible to any one. Dear me, this is an occasion that makes a man speculate on all he has lost. Dear, 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 to think that there might have been a Mrs. Lorry any time these fifty years almost. Not at all from Miss Pross. "'You think that there never might have been a Mrs. Lorry?' asked the gentleman of that name. Pooh, rejoined Miss Pross, "'you were a bachelor in your cradle.' "'Well,' observed Mr. Lorry, beamingly adjusting his little wig, "'that seems probable, too.' "'And you were cut out for a bachelor,' pursued Miss Pross, "'before you were put in your cradle.' "'Then, I think,' said Mr. Lorry, that I was very unhandsomely dealt with, and that I ought to have had a voice in the selection of my pattern. Enough! Now, my dear Lucy, drawing his arm soothingly round her waist, I hear them moving in the next room, and Miss Pross and I, as two formal folks of business, are anxious not to lose the final opportunity of saying something to you that you wish to hear. You leave your good father, my dear, in hands as earnest and as loving as your own. He shall be taken every conceivable care of during the next fortnight, while you are in Warwickshire and thereabouts. Even Telson shall go to the wall, comparatively speaking, before him. And when, at the fortnight's end, he comes to join you and your beloved husband on your other fortnight's trip in Wales, you shall say that we have sent him to you in the best health and in the happiest frame. Now I hear somebody's step coming to the door. Let me kiss my dear girl with an old-fashioned bachelor blessing before somebody comes to claim his own." For a moment he held the fair face from him, to look at the well-remembered expression on the forehead, and then laid the bright golden hair against his little brown wig, with a genuine tenderness and delicacy, which, if such things be old-fashioned, were as old as Adam. The door of the doctor's room opened, and he came out with Charles Darnay. He was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of colour was to be seen in his face. But in the composure of his manner he was unaltered, except that to the shrewd glance of Mr. Lorry it disclosed some shadowy indication that the old air of avoidance and dread had lately passed over him like a cold wind. He gave his arm to his daughter, and took her downstairs to the chariot which Mr. Lorry had hired in honour of the day. 
The rest followed in another carriage, and soon, in a neighbouring church where no strange eyes looked on, Charles Darnay and Lucy Manette were happily married. Besides the glancing tears that shone among the smiles of the little group when it was done, some diamonds, very bright and sparkling, glanced on the bride's hand, which were newly released from the dark obscurity of one of Mr. Lorry's pockets. They returned home to breakfast, and all went well, and in due course the golden hair that had mingled with the poor shoemaker's white locks in the Paris garret were mingled with them again in the morning sunlight, on on the threshold of the door at parting. It was a hard parting, though it was not for long. But her father cheered her, and said at last, gently disengaging himself from her enfolding arms, "'Take her, child, she is yours!' And her agitated hand waved to them from a chaise window, and she was gone. The corner being out of the way of the idle and curious, and the preparations having been very simple and few, the doctor, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross were left quite alone. It was when they turned into the welcome shade of the cool old hall that Mr. Lorry observed a great change to have come over the doctor, as if the golden arm uplifted there had struck him a poisoned blow. He had naturally repressed much, and some revulsion might have been expected in him when the occasion for repression was gone, but it was the old, scared, lost look that troubled Mr. Lorry, and through his absent manner of clasping his head and drearily wandering away into his own room when they got upstairs, Mr. Lorry was reminded of Defarge, the wine-shop keeper, and the starlight ride. "'I think,' he whispered to Miss Pross, after anxious consideration, "'I think we had best not speak to him just now, or at all disturb him. I must look in at Telson's, so I will go there at once, and come back presently. Then we will take him a ride into the country, and dine there, and all will be well.' It was easier for Mr. Lorry to look in at Telson's than to look out of Telson's. He was detained two hours. When he came back, he ascended the old staircase alone, having asked no question of the servant. Going thus into the doctor's rooms, he was stopped by a low sound of knocking. "'Good God!' he said with a start. "'What's that?' Miss Pross, with a terrified face, was at his ear. "'Oh, me! Oh, me! All is lost!' cried she, wringing her hands. "'What is to be told to Lady Bird? He doesn't know me, and is making shoes!' Mr. Lorry said what he could to calm her, and went himself into the doctor's room. The bench was turned towards the light, as it had been when he had seen the shoemaker at his work before, and his head was bent down, and he was very busy. "'Dr. Manette, my dear friend, Dr. Manette!' The doctor looked at him for a moment, half inquiringly, half as if he were angry at being spoken to, and bent over his work again. He had laid aside his coat and waistcoat. His shirt was open at the throat, as it used to be when he did that work, and even the old haggard, faded surface of face had come back to him. He worked hard, impatiently, as if in some sense of having been interrupted. Mr. Lorry glanced at the work in his hand, and observed that it was a shoe of the old size and shape. He took up another that was lying by him, and asked what it was. "'A young lady's walking shoe,' he muttered, without looking up. "'It ought to have been finished long ago. Let it be.' "'But, Dr. Manette, look at me!' He obeyed in the old mechanically submissive manner, without pausing in his work. "'You know me, my dear friend? Think again. This is not your proper occupation. Think, dear friend!' Nothing would induce him to speak more. He looked up for an instant at a time when he was requested to do so, but no persuasion would extract a word from him. He worked, and worked, and worked in silence, and words fell on him as they would have fallen on an echoless wall, or on the air. 
the only ray of hope that mr lorry could discover was that he sometimes furtively looked up without being asked in that there seemed a faint expression of curiosity or perplexity as though he were trying to reconcile some doubts in his mind two things at once impressed themselves on mr lorry as important above all others the first that this must be kept secret from lucy the second that it must be kept secret from all who knew him in conjunction with miss pross he took immediate steps towards the latter precaution by giving out that the doctor was not well and required a few days of complete rest in aid of the kind deception to be practised on his daughter miss pross was to write describing his having been called away professionally and referring to an imaginary letter of two or three hurried lines in his own hand represented to have been addressed to her by the same post these measures advisable to be taken in any case mr lorry took in the hope of his coming to himself if that should happen soon he kept another course in reserve which was to have a certain opinion that he thought the best on the doctor's case in the hope of his recovery and of resort to this third course being thereby rendered practicable mr lorry resolved to watch him attentively with as little appearance as possible of doing so he therefore made arrangements to absent himself from tellson's for the first time in his life and took his post by the window in the same room he was not long in discovering that it was worse than useless to speak to him since on being pressed he became worried he abandoned that attempt on the first day and resolved merely to keep himself always before him as a silent protest against the delusion into which he had fallen or was falling he remained therefore in his seat near the window reading and writing and expressing in as many pleasant and natural ways as he could think of that it was a free place Dr. Manette took what was given him to eat and drink, and worked on that first day until it was too dark to see. Worked on half an hour after Mr. Lorry could not have seen for his life to read or write. When he put his tools aside as useless until morning, Mr. Lorry rose and said to him, "'Will you go out?' He looked down at the floor on either side of him in the old manner, looked up in the old manner, and repeated in the old, low voice, Out? Yes, for a walk with me. Why not? He made no effort to say why not, and said not a word more. But Mr. Lorry thought he saw, as he leaned forward on his bench in the dusk, with his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands, that he was in some misty way asking himself, why not? The sagacity of the man of business perceived an advantage here, and determined to hold it. Miss Pross and he divided the night into two watches, and observed him at intervals from the adjoining room. He paced up and down for a long time before he lay down, but when he did finally lay himself down he fell asleep. In the morning he was up betimes, and went straight to his bench and to work. On this second day Mr. Lorry saluted him cheerfully by his name, and spoke to him on topics that had been of late familiar to them. He returned no reply, but it was evident that he heard what was said, and that he thought about it, however confusedly. This encouraged Mr. Lorry to have Miss Pross in with her work several times during the day. At those times they quietly spoke of Lucy, and of her father then present, precisely in the usual manner, and as if there was nothing amiss. This was done without any demonstrative accompaniment, not long enough or often enough to harass him, and it lightened Mr. Lorry's friendly heart to believe that he looked up oftener, and that he appeared to be stirred by some perception of inconsistencies surrounding him. When it fell dark again, Mr. Lorry asked him as before, "'Dear doctor, will you go out?' As before, he repeated, out? Yes, for a walk with me. Why not? 
This time Mr. Lorry feigned to go out when he could extract no answer from him, and after remaining absent for an hour, returned. In the meanwhile the doctor had removed to the seat in the window, and had sat there looking down at the plane tree, but on Mr. Lorry's return he slipped away to his bench. The time went very slowly on, and Mr. Lorry's hope darkened, and his heart grew heavier again, and grew yet heavier and heavier every day. The third day came and went, the fourth, the fifth, five days, six days, seven days, eight days, nine days. With a hope ever darkening, and with a heart always growing heavier and heavier, Mr. Lorry passed through this anxious time. The secret was well kept, and Lucy was unconscious and happy. But he could not fail to observe that the shoemaker, whose hand had been a little out at first, was growing dreadfully skilful, and that he had never been so intent on his work, and that his hands had never been so nimble and expert as in the dusk of the ninth evening. End of Book Two, Chapter Eighteen.